There are some who will always say that bigger is always better. But is that really true? Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the question of battleships in the era of original Star Trek. That being, of course, the mid to late 23rd century. Uh, I really want to cover this topic because there's been an awful lot of beta canon designs over the years, and just to be clear, I am not covering all of them, not by a long shot. There are many, many more, uh, but I'm covering a couple of examples where we can kind of delve into the issues that they present. The reason I think that TOS battleships come up as a point of discussion is because in the original series, the Enterprise is not necessarily the biggest starship, or indeed the flagship. It's just another ship of the time. It's not yet distinguished itself. So it's highly likely, or speculated to be quite likely, that there are other ships out there that are bigger and heavier than the Constitution-class cruisers, which of course are very much modelled off of the Constitution-class frigates. While impressive, still very far away from being ships of the line. So the real question is, did Starfleet have ships of the line in this period, and what did they look like? It's also worth remembering that for the most part, the Enterprise is out on the frontier. The Constitution is the big boy of the frontier. But as we move forward, are there perhaps bigger boys? Well, in this video, we'll look into that idea. So in terms of looking at TOS battleships, we need to define some parameters about what a TOS battleship can actually be. What is kind of acceptable within the parameters of TOS without breaking continuity or feeling anachronistic or out of place. And so we have to say that a original series era battleship has to be bigger than a constitution class but smaller than an Excelsior class, because otherwise you take away the uniqueness and the significance of the Excelsior class. It needs to have a sense of size and bulk. It has to have a unique structure. It can't just be an enlarged constitution. It's got to be different, and it's got to have a distinct and defined role. It has to have a good reason for being it's got to have some hard limits and some real flaws. There's got to be a reason as to why we don't see them at all during original series and why they would in all likelihood be quite rare ships. The point is ultimately that the Constitution is a more uh, salient and sound design than any of these battleships that might have occurred at the same time. So without any further ado, let's get into the candidates. We'll be going through in a chronological order. So the first ship to talk about is the Federation class or Dreadnought class, not the Foley class. Stop calling it that. And I have some very nasty things to say about this ship. It's first worth mentioning that, of course, this is a Starfleet battle design. And in that respect, I will cut it some slack. It could be accused of being a giant enterprise. However, there are a couple bits of structure that just get it out of that. It has a distinctive saucer, but much more dome-like than the Constitution. It also has a lower set of primary nacelles. The nacelles are actually lower set. And, of course, we have a large secondary hull mounting a forward-facing shuttle bay. And, critically, of course, we have the infamous third nacelle. Now, long-time viewers of the channel will be aware that I have strong views on three nacelle ships and how to do them properly, and that they can be properly done. The Federation class is not a good example of this, and indeed is responsible for the abomination that is, in fact, the Galaxy X. Fight me. We do not have here an example of uh, trinacell drive. What we actually have is a very early example of dual mode drive. So essentially what's going on is that the third nacelle is serving as a point of adjustment to move the warp field. So there's a line that is effectively running between the third nacelle and the primary set of nacelles. And along that line, anywhere along that line, you can center your warp field. And that will produce slightly different warp geometries depending on its position. 
Now, it is worth saying that this is not the best system. It's not very stable. There's a reason we won't see it. It's a good experiment, possibly, but yeah, it doesn't work and you don't get much for it. As you can see, all the other ships that we will be talking about actually have superior warp geometry, even the ones that aren't trying to. Now, I can see this actually serving as a relatively far out ship. I can see it being served as essentially a frontier flagship, so in command of groups of constitutions on the frontier. I can see this as being the first battleship on the scene. I can see it having a very impressive phaser battery in the saucer, and it would have a good ability to launch shuttlecraft, but essentially it's really just a command ship. It's not that far beyond the capabilities of a constitution, just a bit heavier, bit slower, bit more powerful, but really it's only a um, iterative jump. It's not a significant jump in capabilities. Now that isn't the case for our next vessel, the Proxima class. This thing is big. This is 380 meters long. It actually has a more shallow saucer and it has two engineering hulls and four nacelles. So each set of nacelles is being powered by a separate warp reactor. This gives it incredibly high power. It's bigger and better than the Dreadnought, but it is slower because it's substantially heavier and it lacks even more maneuverability than even the Dreadnought does. However, its dual mode warp drive is much more stable and much more reliable, but it is costly. It's a lot more expensive to run the Proxima as compared to a Dreadnought because you have to power two separate reactors. And so fuel consumption for this thing is a big, big issue because it is twice the consumption rates of a Dreadnought class. So the Proxima is a good example of a original series era battleship, and I can see this being most certainly confined to the core worlds of the Federation, that last line of defense, really a sort of a, a coastal battleship, so to speak. Now, it's heavy, it's powerful, it hits bloody hard, but it can't really move all that much. So these are two examples from, well, Starfleet Battles and FASA, old beta cannon. Now let's take a look at two examples from Star Trek Online, because they're similar but also quite different. Let's talk about the Gemini class, which is a quad nacelle design. Now it's interesting because it is a bespoke build. It is a completely bespoke saucer. It's a very thick saucer, very thick saucer. And it has one single huge reactor. This would actually be a very good candidate probably for fitting in the ridiculously huge engineering set from Star Trek Strange New Worlds. I can see people actually getting into, I can see the engine in the Gemini actually being this big and, you know, having that kind of scale. And also, you know, meaning that people will catch radiation poisoning from the fact that they're just standing out in the middle of the warp core. This thing is extremely fast, and it's also big. It's 350 meters long, so it's really big. Although, interestingly, even though the Constellation class that would replace it is shorter, it actually has a similar size saucer. But the Gemini is extraordinarily fast. You can imagine with a reactor of that size, it's going to burn through fuel. It's also going to burn through fuel in a more unusual way that actually will make it harder to resupply than even a Proxima class would because it's just one big core rather than two separate cores. So it's harder to get like correct fuel allocations. It has two heavy prow phasers. And I mean, these things hit hard. These are like the equivalent of lances in the time, but they're effectively extended range, long range phasers. It also would have at least six prow torpedo tubes, probably more than that, but at least six, and a decent port and starboard battery, but a non-existent aft battery. And the fact that it is slow to turn, because again, of its large size, it's fast in a straight line, uh, but when it comes to actually turning and maneuvering, 
it it suffers a lot and again we can see why it would be replaced by something like the constellation which is a little bit lighter and more maneuverable while still actually ending up mounting a similar level of firepower then we get the atlas class this thing is quite interesting it's actually very reminiscent of the yorktown class from the 22nd century you can see an awful lot of shared structure between the two ships they are very very similar this is something in the region of 430 meters long so you're just coming in shy of excelsior excelsior is still bigger but it's closing in on that kind of size and it is maybe too big the atlas class is really conceived as a assault battleship it's designed to carry marines and supplies and all that would be needed for a planetary invasion. It's much, much slower than the Proxima. And it's really trying to imitate, actually, in terms of role, the Geronimo class from the Four Years' War. Although the, the Geronimo class gets away with what it did by being actually only a cruiser. Whereas this is trying to scale it up to battleship levels. I think it doesn't work because it is trying to be too much and really it is doing nothing that cannot be done by other classes of ship more efficiently. I think it's it's spreading itself too thin and trying to do too much. It's too much of a liability and I don't see it having much capability in space combat independently. I think it's a ship that would really need a lot of support and covering in a way that I don't think any of the other battleships that we talk about would have that problem i think each of them would be capable of of handling themselves in a very particular situation and with a very particular set of tactics but i i can only see the atlas surviving if it is supported by a fleet and in that respect it then becomes a bit of a, a dead weight so it's worth remarking that for original series battleships we are actually talking about a pretty small era of time we are talking about 40 years from 2250 to 2290 this is 40 years only 20 years of which is actually during the tos era and the second half is during the motion picture era and again you start then having to compete with things like excelsior coming into the mix and you know some of these ships i think would take better to refits than others so for example i think the dreadnought class and the proxima class would adapt very well to being refitted where the Gemini class really wouldn't. But it's a very narrow window of time for these things to exist in. And ultimately, these things are not the most practical thing. They are grasping for a future that has not yet arrived. And so their capabilities are actually very narrow in terms of what they can do. Now, they are impressive ships. They are impressive pieces of engineering. But they do suffer from being products of their time and they're essentially trying to achieve something which the technology is not yet mature enough for it to do. Think about, for example, the King Tiger tank and put it next to a M60 Patton tank. These are, at least if you look at it on the very surface level, these are very similar vehicles. You know, the Germans are kind of reaching with the, the King Tiger towards that kind of concept. The Germans were trying to do that with 1940s technology the brits and americans only attempted m103 and conqueror with 1950s technology there's a big difference so that's worth bearing in mind unlike the 24th century ships they really require a particular niche in order to fit in and play to their strengths. They can't really be generalists. There's there's not really that capability. And they are really little use beyond the niche. Uh, Proxima and Gemini, I think, are the best examples of filling their niche. The Proxima knows what it's about. The Proxima knows that it's not going to go out that far. It's not going to try and uh, be aggressive and go on the offensive and you know be out there on the frontier it's going to be that last line of defense and it's going to be a solid wall to whatever is coming at it and in that the proxima is incredibly strong it is ready and it is waiting for you similarly the gemini is going to come at you with 
colossal amounts of speed and aggression. Probably not that much time because it's going to rip through its fuel like nobody's business, but it will bear down on you and overwhelm certainly anyone who's disorganized. Uh, you know, if you've got a enemy heavy cruiser or battle cruiser that's out on its own and unsupported, it's gotten lost or whatever, that's just an easy target for the Gemini to just charge that down. And I can see the Gemini being very useful, particularly in a counter-attacking role. You know, let's say the Klingons flood across the Federation border in large numbers and the initial lines of Federation defense are broken. Well, I can actually see the Gemini being able to rally those ships, lead them back on an attack and probably actually produce enough momentum in the force in order to send the Klingons, if not to turn the Klingons completely, then at least scatter and disrupt their invasion. I actually will say that in terms of capability, I will give some credit to the Federation class, because the Federation class is not trying to be too much. It's fundamentally a command ship with a little bit of jank going on. Having it be a dual mode uh, warp drive ship does actually help it make a bit of sense. It's ugly, but that's the TOS era. It's kind of meant to be a little bit ugly by modern standards and janky, but I can definitely see it as being a command a command battleship, you know, out there supporting the constitutions and ready to go into action as the, the sort of the first of the battleships. So the only real loser, I would say, is the Atlas. And the Atlas fails because it doesn't find itself a niche. It tries to do too much with fundamentally too little technology of the time. And so that's really my views on original series era battleships. But what are yours? Let me know in the comments below. Are there some that I've missed? What are your thoughts on, for example, the Tier class? I didn't cover that. Or the Yamato class? Give those a little look. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And I will see you all in the next video. Thank you to my members, my loyal Navarks, Jeffrey Ballard, Tully DT, Rella, and David Reeves, my dutiful commanders, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, Philip Ty, Bird Monster, Jeff Hallam, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Narata, Adam Bowman, Nathaniel Mead, DM Tribal Typhoon, Gabe Logan, Mr. Flegel, Nicholas Walsh, JC Tech Wizard, Rizel 3D, and James C. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ocalcatum Quaesto, Squadra Course, John Nicole, Athies Collection, Tobias Klein, Greg Martin, and Shermos. And I thank all my loyal sub lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.